Well, friends, we are in week five of Ephesians, and um, and it feels a little bit like fifth third, but that makes th- sense up here. We're in the fifth week, but this is the third installment of a little center series that started out with Children of Wrath, then Saved by Grace through Faith, and then um, and then today redeemed for his purposes, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to spend the entire day in one text in Ephesians 2.10, um, but here's, here's the reality that, that we face in this, is um, in looking at this one text, I believe, and so do other theologians, that Scripture interprets Scripture. You want to find out what that verse means? Look at it in the context of the canon of Scripture and understand what God's saying over the long haul and specifically into reality. So what we want to do today is we're going to take this one verse from Ephesians and we are going to look at it through the lens of really four different Scriptures throughout Old and New Testament. Okay? It's going to be awesome. And the reason it's awesome is this. We understand that we are Children of wrath, very sinful, very broken, right? You and I both know there's hidden things in our lives we never want out. There's things we've done or maybe habits we can't break and we feel owned by them. And what I want to do today is is just say, yes, we are. We're people broken by sin. We have a broken heredity. But as Paul said, we are saved by grace through faith. We are saved by the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that new life, there is a grace for us to be more. There's a grace for us to live freely in God. But the real question is, coming out of understanding that we're saved by grace through faith is, but why? Why did he save us? Why did he show such grace? And I think the first thing is, is because he loves us. Man, the church gets this wrong sometimes. We think of God sitting up in heaven, white bearded, with a lightning rod and a smite button. Just kapow. (laughs) That is not God. That is not what it looks like. He loves us. He's for us. So when we look at this, we understand when we ask the question, but why would God save us by grace through faith? Because he loves us, but also because he wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to not only love us, but he wants us to return that love and be in a relationship, be in a connected relationship. Here's the thing that I think is really important. If we are children of sin who have now been redeemed and saved by grace through faith, we often as a church get this wrong. People get to the altar, they accept Jesus, and they're like, oh, I made it. I'm saved, and then they just quit living. Have you ever seen an Olympian, like a sprinter, one of those people who just runs like a deer, you know, and, and they get down their little stance. I don't know how they run. I've never been a sprinter. But they're like in this little stance. You know what, I'm going to use a a term I know better. Have you ever seen an NFL lineman? I'm shaped a little more like that. Um, An NFL lineman get down to his three-point stance and the snap of the ball be like, whew, that was a tough play. And they just get bowled over. No, when the ball snaps, they actually begin. They take off into motion. When we get saved, that's the snap of the ball spiritually. That's when we take off. We don't arrive at salvation. We begin at salvation. We take off living in a brand new way that defines who the church is. We know that we are broken and sinful, but we are redeemed in Christ by grace through faith, and now we are made purposeful according to his plan. Salvation isn't the beginning, isn't the, isn't the end of our life. It's the beginning of our full new life in Christ. Salvation is the beginning of your new life. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, in what it says. Paul writes, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we, the church, are God's handiwork. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a pretty good thought right there, isn't it? Have you ever thought of yourself like that? We're going to look at it here. We're going to talk about it. I want you to remember that we're going to look at, I'm going to share some different scriptures that interpret what that means. We're going to look at it really in four bites. First bite is this, we are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork. Here's what the church can't lose in our identity. We can't lose that we are God's handiwork. We are not God's biological happenstance. 
We are not here because biology finally got it right in the universe and katow, humanity. No, that's not how it worked. We are created. We were formed from dust and the very breath of God blown into the nostrils of Adam. You were, and Eve, you were knit together in your mother's womb, created by the craftsmanship of God. God's handiwork. And what would scripture say about this? I think scripture would say that you have an intrinsic value because you were valued enough to be made. And if we lose the conversation on creation and we're like, I don't know, maybe we did come from monkeys, then we have lost our value. Our value is in that we are God's handiwork. We are created by him, in him, and for him. Your value is that God didn't see you as a molecular coming together, but as a purposeful person worth knowing and loving. Your value is in these words. So God created mankind in his image. In his image, he created them. Male and female, they were created. You came to be because he wanted you, and that matters. And I will tell you this, there are many of you sitting in a room like this who have been broken by abuse. You've been abused by someone. Maybe someone has treated you wickedly in terms of sexuality. You've been abused there. There's many of you who have been verbally, emotionally assaulted and your worth was called into value and thrown into the gutter and you were told time and again that you're not worth anything. You're, you're, you're of no value. Scripture disagrees, and so does your creator. Almighty God thinks you have an intrinsic value that he loves. And not only does he love it, it reflects something of him. You are God's handiwork, not nature's happenstance. No matter what someone has done to you, they can't remove the value God wove into you. The next thing we know is this, that you are created in Christ Jesus. Think about that. So we are broken in sin, but we are recreated in Christ Jesus. Let me read the scripture and then we'll talk about it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. It tells me this. That maybe God likes Chip and Joanna Gaines a lot. You're like, what? Oh, yeah. We're going DIY for a minute. Here's what we're going to do. Who here watches Fixer Up Forever? Anybody? Yeah, all the guys are like, no, I don't, but I'll raise my elbow. Because um, here's the thing. The mastery of Chip and Joanna is that Chip is kind of like all of us. You're like, I don't know why I want to take my shirt off and do weird things, but I do. I, maybe it's a guy thing. So Chip, you know, awesome. Then there's Joanna who endures him, but she has this wonderful eye, and, and they take like an old Victorian home, and it has good bones, and it's in a good neighborhood, but it's pretty dilapidated, and they look at it, and they see potential in a decaying and rotting edifice. They see potential, and what do they do? They go in, and they gut it. They gut it out. Now, Christians always get a hard time. I don't understand what Christians are saying because they talk their own language. Hello, brother. Would you like fellowship? I don't know. Is that a boat? Like, you don't know what it is, right? <laughs> but don't act like it's that weird because you didn't know what shiplap was till about five years ago, right? If somebody's like, shiplap, you're like, is that for a boat too? Does that happen in church with fellowship, right? We don't understand all the time how that works, but we know this, that we, we're created in Christ Jesus. So let's just take a minute and use the metaphor of the old Victorian house. And you may think, why? Because this works. In the Hebrew, do you know what, how they, what word they used to describe the temple as? It was the house of God. In Greek, the words of the language of the New Testament, do you know how they describe the temple? It's the house. The house. Do you not know? That your body is the house of the Holy Spirit? Maybe this is a good metaphor. Maybe for you and I today, we are going to look at a fixer-upper. 
And we're going to see where maybe God put in a pretty cool like little butcher's sink and shiplap and some different things. And we're going to recognize that our lives are not just good bones. God's doing something because we're created in Christ Jesus. He goes in and he guts out all the old decay and these things. Remember what Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, which means the old has gone and the new has come. There had to be demolition. Something had to die in you and be set aside. So don't tell me, I think you can just put a coat of paint on it. You can't. It's lipstick on a pig, isn't it? It doesn't look real good. But when we go through and we let God gut us out and he lays bare everything in our life and he rebuilds us in the image of our Heavenly Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We take on the living image of Jesus Christ. We become, well, we become beautiful, don't we? What was once old and in decay has been remade, and the old is gone, and the new has come, and you can't fully understand it until you go in and see and observe the craftsmanship of the one who did the work. So we get to look at this and understand that the old us it still kind of looks the same, doesn't it? We look on the outside, you look at us, and you're like, yeah, that's, the, that's Eric. You can look at me and see who I am. But when you open the door to my life, something should be markedly different when you look in. And there should be areas under construction, and there should be areas that are absolutely transformed and beautiful. Why? Because the master craftsman is at work in the lives of his church. How nice is that, that you don't have to do it, that he's at work in your life. He's at work in my life. You are created in Christ Jesus, but you were also created to do good works, as Paul said. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, and what that means for us is that our life can't be a museum. It must be, well, alive. It must look and feel like the craftsman and the work he's done. John 15 Verse 8 tells us that we are created to do good works, but that means we're purposeful. Everything we do has purpose in it. And John 15, 8 says this, the words of Jesus. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my disciples. Which means your good works actually produce life. Fruitful living means that, that the crop grows And you can pick it, and it provides life to the community around it. Your life should be fruitful as a Christian. You should be growing the life of Christ off of you and giving life to the world around you. And here's how I kind of look at this. A lot of times we as Christians think, um, okay, I'm saved. Okay, God changed me. I'm not doing all those bad things anymore. And we're good to just step back there. But how sad would it be if Chip and Joanna said, you ready to see your fixer-upper? They pulled it back, and people were like, that's amazing. They go tour it, and then everybody's like, oh, you guys are the best, and they, it's just perfect. And they're like, all right, that's awesome. Thanks for letting us do this project. And they deadbolt it, lock it up, and say, don't ever go in there again. It's perfect. You'd be like, well, what'd you fix it up for? You doorknob, it's just going to sit there and rot. The, the pipes will never have water moving through to wash clothes and dishes and babies and whatever else. And the sink will just sit there, and it'll get old and dirty and caked up and dusty, but it'll never have the grime from lasagna because you had a family meal. The floors will never need to be swept. The laundry room will always be pristine because there wasn't a family living in it. There wasn't life going on in it. It just sat there like a mausoleum to a reformation instead of a living witness. Our lives are supposed to be a house occupied, alive, We are supposed to be fully alive doing things. The beauty of a changed old house is the way people live in it. Again, it's no longer abandoned and worthless and a little bit scary. It's fully open to the world, and you can share meals and moments and tears and joy in that place. You can celebrate holidays. You come alive in that house. How sad if we never participated on God's terms in the life we were given. We just reformed the outside, the inside. God did his work, and we locked it up and said, don't get it dirty. God wants us to get it dirty. He wants there to be life in here. He wants the facade not only to look good, but to live good. You've got to come to life in this. You would never finish a restoration 
and say, okay, the house has served its purpose. You would say, okay, now we can live in it. And the same thing goes for our Christian life. We have to be people who understand the value of living the life we were given. Finally, Ephesians goes on to say that God prepared in advance for us to do. And you're like, what does that mean? The good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. It tells us something. It tells us that this also, our creation and our current living, isn't happenstance. It isn't random. It's purposeful because God has prepared in advance a life for you to live. The choice is yours to live it or to watch someone else live around you. We get to live a life that God has planned ahead of us. You may think like, I don't like that. I want to make my own decisions. If you don't like that, I guarantee you'll like this. Every Christian loves this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for evil. Plans to bless you and give you a future and a hope. You tell me there isn't a bell ringing in every Christian who hears those words. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. It tells you this. Oh, thank God it's not up to me because I am bad at life. But he's not. See, we are part of God's plan. God is bringing his kingdom to bear on the world around us. And I love what that Catholic saint said. Do you not know that Christ doesn't have a physical body here outside of you? He chose you to be his eyes, his hands, his feet, to live. And he planned your steps out, plans to give you a future and a hope. Amid the bleakness and the brokenness of this world, there is a hope and it rings in the Christian church and it rings in the Christian life and it's found in a life, a house full of the Holy Spirit being fully lived for the purposes of God which he always intended for you to live out. So how do you apply something like this? How do we take something like this and apply it straight into our life? Here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to look back this week. I'd like you to take a moment and just look back at maybe what the old Victorian house called you looked like a while back and see that God has done a lot of restoration. I'm not saying there isn't significant areas under construction in your life and mine. I'm saying look back and see that God has been faithful in so many ways to get you here and to use you in spite of you clear till now. Look back and understand that there is a lie of the enemy trying to tell you that you're insignificant. Why would he tell you that? Because he doesn't want you to live into how significant you actually are. You were called by the power of the Spirit to change this world. And he knows that if he can break your sense of value, you, you'll never believe it. But if you look back, you'll see that from the cross of Christ, he's been planning your life, looking for ways he can use and empower you to live forward. The way he has the saints of the church from the death of Christ, his resurrection, all the way forward. He used fishermen, tax collectors, and the different people of the lower class. Thank God for us then, right? We get to be God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for his purposes. The only way we'll believe it is if we look back and see the work he's already accomplished. And we believe that we have a value to God. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Spirit of God live through you in such a way that allows you not only to see the past, but then to do the harder work right now of being present. This is really tough for most of us. Most of us have a really hard time being present to the life we're at. I want you to do me a favor. If you have a phone or a watch, I want you to look at it. It's 11.53. Oh, we got a little long. That was disappointing. Um, 11.53. Tomorrow, I want you to look back at 11.53 and take account of that 24-hour period. And the next day, I want you to look back at 11.53, 10 minutes to lunch. And I want you to look back and take account and see what's going on. But I also want you to ask the question, what right now can I do? What can I do with today's 11.53? Because I only get it once, and who's around me now that I could be present to? The great disease of our culture is this little five-inch screen where you sit with families like this. Hey, Dad. Yeah. Can I go do this? Uh-huh. I'm not imitating you. I'm imitating me. 
I can be that dad. You can be that parent. You can be that spouse. You can be that friend where you're bound to a screen. You're not present to the life you're living. Oswald Chambers has a way of helping us see how important it is to be present, to be part of right now. Oswald says it this way. Do not say that you cannot be of any use to God where you are now because you are surely of no use to him where you are not. Isn't that good? You're like, oh, if I was in Morocco, God could use me. We can't, well, no. Be of use in Zealand right now. Be of use to God right where you are because he can't use you where you're not. He puts you here purposefully. He has a plan. Finally, we need to look at what it means to be in the right place at the right time. Since we know we're created, since we know that in our life God is planning things out for us, moments for us to connect with him, we can take the isolated randomness of our life and realize that God was always sovereign over it. I'll tell you a story of my life where I saw this happen. A um, number of years ago, I think it was around 2010 or something, we were, uh, as a family, we had gone, oh, we went to the Wisconsin Dells. Yeah, little indoor water park with the Wisconsin folk. And um, we were coming back, and I wanted to go to the North Face outlet because I have a certain desire for such things. And um, I wanted to go there, and Eric is like, it's kind of out of the way. I'm like, it's North Face outlet. It's cheaper. I have to go. I have an addiction. And so um, we went. And on our way back home, Erica said, I would really like a cup of coffee. That doesn't mean Russ's. So we went to, um, not that Russ's has, well, they do have bad coffee, but their food's all right. Um, so we went to Starbucks, went to an oasis uh, coming into Chicagoland. We went to an oasis, and we, we got off, and there's a Starbucks in there, and as we're walking out, kind of like herding cats, you know, when you have little kids, you're like, no, stop licking the person's door. And you're like, you know, and the kid's just like, mm, like oh, my children, it's wrong. And you're like getting them to the car, and as we're getting them to the car, I could hear this sound. And it was, I don't want to die. <laughs> okay, we're just going to keep going. And then I hear a girl screaming, help, help. And I'm just like, this is the worst. Right? I didn't know what to do. I have a little bit of a first responder in me. I want to help, but I'm not real useful. And uh, so I'm just like, it's okay. We have, we have kids. We're good. Steered the little herd, got him in the Mercury Sable, and uh, and got him in there and locked him in. Got in. I get into the car. I was like, I don't want to die. Help! Time to go home to Zealand. Career, you know, being the good Christian that I was. And um, I finally got the car started. And I was like, I got to check. You know, nobility got the best of me. So I get out. And I'm walking towards this person. It's a clear medical situation, which I'm not good at. If you have a splinter, eh, it depends on how big it is. If you have blood, there's got to be a mom nearby. Don't bring it to me. And if you're ser like, if I can see a piece of meat and it's not attached to a cow, get away. Like, if kids are injured. I'm like, I'm sorry, son. We'll miss you. Like, I just don't have that gift, right? I don't like, when someone sticks me with a needle, I'm like, uh, I'm just not medical. I don't have it. I don't like it. It's gross. It's bocky. It's the inside. And um, so I don't like it. I'm walking up. It's a clear medical situation for which I am woefully qualified. Terrible. Terrible. I'm like, oh, man, you're going to die. You know, I just, I have no good. Terrible. I walk up, and there's a kid, probably 14, 15, going, ah, and he's fighting to get air in. That's what it sounded like. It was a good impersonation. Like, he's like, ah, and I'm like, Oh, man, this dude's shutting down. His eyes are rolling. He's kind of going slack. His color's completely gone. His sister is like a wild chicken, just -da -da -da, all over the place. His grandparents are there, and they're just like, what's the matter? They, they're in shell shock. They can't believe this happened. They're like, you should probably breathe. Like, they look like they were just kind of like lethargic. And so I walk up, and I'm like, what's going on? Why are you dying? <gasps> <laughs> like, I have no qualifications. You don't want me to be your doctor, right? <laughs> That's not safe. And I don't know why God used it, but it, I looked at it, and I'm like, this is just not my first thought. I wish you could see inside my brain how this isn't my first thought. I'm like, does he have any allergies? Yes. To what? Peanuts. Was he near peanuts? 
well, we were at Six Flags. I was like, peanuts at Six Flags. Not Charlie Brown, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, did you go to a little thing? And he's just sitting there going, yes. And I looked at his grandparents. I said, he's allergic to peanuts. And the grandfather goes, yes. And I said, did his mom send an EpiPen? And they're like, oh, yeah. Yeah. We have one in the, tr- in the, in the glove box. Want to get it? <laughs> like, I'm just struggling. And they pull it out, and I look at it. It looks like it has two ends. I'm like, so I open it. I do not know what to do with an EpiPen. Like, says you need to stick him in the leg without, like, pants between it. So his grandma's like, whoop, drops his pants. I'm like, what is happening? So I'm like, oh, that was the right end. And he's like, oh. Three minutes later, he's like, <laughs> he's getting air in. He's kind of a little more conscious. I'm a medical hero at this point. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there just going, I am not equipped for this. This is not me. Can we put his pants back on? What is happening? I wanted coffee and a new vest. You know? I, what in the world? God, why here? Why now? The EMTs pull in a few minutes later, and they said this. Had you not given him the EpiPen then, the epinephrine wouldn't have done it. They would have had to trach him, or they would have lost him. And I was like, whose house? I was so happy. I was like, oh, I did it. I was not equipped. I didn't feel confident. I was scared to death, and I wanted to run away. But God had a plan on that day. For a little boy, we prayed with him. We sent him off down the highway back to Joliet, Illinois. And uh, thankfully, I've never seen him again at a rest stop or otherwise. (laughs) Right? It was awesome. But I'll tell you this. I wasn't good at it. I don't want to do it twice. I'm not good at it. But I had a moment with God. I have another moment. Where my friend Mike Shermer stood in the gap for me when we were trying to plant this church. And everything was against us. And God put him there. And he stood for me. And I can tell you this. Had Mike and my friend Eric not stood in the gap on those days for that 18 months, this wouldn't be here. I couldn't do it. But God had a plan for them. He had a plan for us. Quit living with the excuses that God's not big enough to use your brokenness. Your life is purposeful in Christ Jesus, created in him, empowered by him. You are the house of God. Live like it. And watch the world change around us. Lord Jesus Christ, as your church, we come to you today. And we ask that whatever we do in word or or in deed would be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that our lives would be a living way of giving thanks to you, God our Father, for the way you redeemed us. Thank you for friends who've walked alongside us when we couldn't tow the rope, when it was too much for us. Thank you for random encounters in our lives that were never random in yours, that you planned to use us to save lives, whether by a meal, by a kind word and conversation, or by some life-saving effort. God, we don't know your plans, but we do know you. So we trust your plans, even if they seem a little fuzzy to us at times. For us, your church, God, we claim it today, that we are your handiwork and created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which you have planned and prepared for us, both presently and in the future. So today, God, we rest back into the hope that you know the plans you have for us. You've declared them, Lord, plans for our welfare, not for evil plans to give us a future and a hope. May that future and hope live in the power and presence of your Holy Spirit who was sent to us when we received Christ so that we may live as a living witness to the world around us that you, Lord Jesus Christ, are not only alive, but you are well and growing your church. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand sing with me. Just listen to it one more time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the pronouns in it. For you are God's handiwork. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And God prepared them in advance for you to do. If you don't know how to go and apply this in your life, you go and obey that little voice in your heart that speaks to you. Be kind to that person. Pick up that piece of trash. Like, there's no point in that. That brings no glory to God, but I'll obey. And just do it. I don't know why it would matter, but it might. Go be the people God redeemed. 
go live and quit worrying, quit saying, I can't do it. You're right. He did. You can't live the life, but he can live it in you. When I look out here, I see a bunch of beautiful Victorian homes that God has redone, all the death and decay removed, and a life ready to live. And as you live that life, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, and may you receive the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, before you go, I'm going to tell you one thing. Take those devotions by the two exits. Spend time in the devotions in God's word and grow as the people of God as you live expanding his kingdom. Church is dismissed.